Call to order the special meeting of the Arts, Culture, and Historic Preservation Commission, June 20th. We'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance, which will be led by Ian Brannan. Brannan, ma'am. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And the roll call. Chairperson Seals. Present. Vice Chairperson Kloss. Commissioner Hackinson. Hawkinson, I'm sorry, yes. Hawkinson. Commissioner Hayes. Present. Commissioner Altamirano. Commissioner Clower. Commissioner Volkar. And Alternate Commissioner Brandeman. Present. Thank you. We have a quorum. Thank you, Daniel. We'll begin with presentations by the public on matters not on the agenda within the jurisdiction of the commission. We're not, we're prohibited by law to discuss, um, but if you'd like to speak to an issue that we don't have listed currently on the agenda, please submit a request to speak to Daniel. Having seen, not seeing any requests to speak, uh, commission communications. Any communications regarding? Great. Uh, consent agenda, approval of the minutes of the March 28th regular meeting of the Arts, Culture, and Historic Preservation Commission. Hopefully you've all had a chance to review those. I need a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Is there a second? I'll second the motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? So moved. Moving, into the, moving to the regular agenda. Item number three, discussion of historic districts. With Dave Tiller, we do have one request to speak. Uh, good evening, Chair Seals um, and members of the commission. Uh, for those of you who may not know me, my name is David Tilly. I'm a principal planner in the community development department. And I was asked to come before your commission this evening to talk about historic districts. So I have a, a couple of slides here to help illustrate, um, illustrate some of the points regarding historic districts. Um, the Commission may be aware and there are, are numerous local examples and national examples of historic districts. Um, here's a few for just from right around our immediate region that you may be familiar with or have been to. Um, Folsom, Woodland, and Elk Grove um, all have uh, similar features in terms of the era of buildings and these are all areas that have some designation and then thus some programming that's based around um, the fact that these are you know, historic areas, be they you know, formally designated as such or, or in, even informally. Um, also here in West Sacramento, if you, we also do have our own formally designated historic district. Um, this is in the Washington neighborhood along 4th Street, um, between the, essentially between the railroad tracks on the north end, um, down to E Street, on the, excuse me, F Street down on, on the southern end. Um, this was a, a subset of the Washington specific plan area that was a specific plan done by the city back in the early to mid 90s. Um, this area was selected because it still to this day retains a handful of uh, significant historic uh, homes, many, some of which are late 1800s into early 1900s. Um, there's some Victorians in there, uh, especially on this northern segment of 4th Street that um, are quite you know, quite um, striking in terms of how well they've been maintained. Um, I really like the robin's egg blue one that's over there with the fish scales um, and the porch. It's really probably the most, you know, beautiful home we have in town in terms of a um, historic building. Um, you know, this area is a sort of a subset of Washington, the neighborhood of Washington, which was first laid out by um, Mary Mac Margaret McDowell back in the um, 1849 um, gold rush era even pre-Tower Bridge, um, pre-even the I Street Bridge came along shortly thereafter. And we have a numerous other historic buildings that are identified in our general plan uh, that are scattered about town, mostly in this generally northern area. Um, another one that's nearby here that's pretty, pretty important is the Washington Firehouse, 
um, which has been on the California Register um, since the 90s. And uh, I was informed recently by the um, parties that's rehabbing the building right now that they're actually have or soon will have it actually on the National Register of Historic Places, uh, which I believe would be the first building in town to be on the National Register um, other than the Tower Bridge itself. So that is a, um, a big achievement um, to be on the National Register. That building uh, was a Work Products Administration building in um, going back to circa 1940 and is a, one of the few examples of that type of architecture that remains. So historic districts in general um, can offer um, numerous potential benefits um, to a given area. Um, we did some research for that on for you and provided that as an attachment um, to your staff report um, this evening. Um, as part of this going on the federal, federal list is there are some tax credit advantages for the property owner. Certainly historic districts, if done well, um, can be um, <coughs> desirable from a tourism standpoint. Um, you know, they help tell our history, of course, which is important from an educational standpoint. Um, maintaining historic buildings in general, rather than having to rebuild everything, um, is a much more sustainable way to go to the extent those buildings are remain, you know, usable, you know, in the current era. Um, and they are a generally an attractive um, district and are, you know, in many communities are a very important part of their community is to be in a historic district. Um, the one that I'm most intrigued by and enjoyed visiting um, not too long ago was uh, Ybor City in Tampa. It is a very exciting place and they have the historic streetcars that run through there and it's a very vibrant, um, vibrant place and is constantly busy with the restaurants and other, other amenities there. So uh, I'll summarize you know, some of the potential benefits for um, if, to do with happening in a, any historic district. And so at this time, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Commissioners? I have a few. Sure, Denise. Um, on your map, it looks like the his, the, that the boundary for the historic district is 3rd Street, is it include, which would put the firehouse outside of that boundary it is the firehouse is outside um, this boundary technically um, but it's certainly right up just right around the corner and so then as you look at the areas north of D Street or the railroad tracks is there um, is there concern about the land the proposed new bridge to replace the I Street bridge is there concern about the landing where people will come off that new bridge as it relates to this historic district? Do you know where that what those landings are supposed to be? Well, yes, the, the new bridge um, would, would be, north, be north of the current I Street Bridge and it would actually land, on, land at C Street. Um, connects with Rail Yards Boulevard in Sacramento over the river and lands at C Street. So uh, the current- well, It lands on C Street now in a convoluted way. Yeah, well, this um, one lands, yeah, this one lands much more directly into current C Street east-west than right now where the I Street Bridge comes over and you have the viaduct. It um, would be about a block north of there. Um, the viaduct itself will actually get demoed um, because it's, it's no longer needed. Um, the current I Street Bridge would remain in place. It's a historic structure owned by Union Pacific because mm -hmm. uh, that clearly we still need to have the rail traffic. Um, our goal is to convert the upper deck into a bike ped facility and then have the new bridge serve the automotive um, facility in this area. So that's a very real project, should be, on, should be under construction probably 2018, 2019, and be done by 2021 or thereabouts. Uh, there's funding for it, it's under design right now. So David, you don't anticipate that this new structure is going to impact what you're defining as a historical district at all? No. Uh, a second question then is, so bringing this to us, the Washington Specific Plan has been around since 1994. Um, are, you in, are, you, are you calling this district out in the general plan update that you're currently working on? Yeah, what, well, yeah Washington Specific Plan is a refinement of the general plan and we'll, we'll complete the general plan update this year. Um, and as soon as that's in the can, we'll launch into a, a significant update to the Washington Specific Plan itself. 
sort of tailing off the uh, Washington Realized um, project that we, that we finished uh, last year. So uh, that's on our work program, and then part of that is, is historic preservation. So Washington is a complete area of focus for us right now, and there'll be many implementation measures coming out of the general plan related to this neighborhood, but the, not the least of which is updating the specific plan. Um, and it, it's due. <laughs> And will those, the defining it in the general plan and updating the Washington specific plan, will you be including design elements as part of that update? You know, historically, pardon the pun, um, that a historic neighborhood can bring with it also, you know, very specific design elements that must be for homeowners that currently own those properties, should they want to make any improvement to their properties? Their Bridgeview Market is one of the few retail areas in, in the defined district um, owned by the same company that's doing the work on the firehouse. Is, is what you're, is, by defining it as a historic district, is that putting constraints on improvements or it doesn't have to. Uh, part of what the Washington plan lacks right now, quite frankly, is good design standards uh, for historic buildings as well as new, de new developments. Mm -hmm. um, we have definitely have struggled with that plan over the years as we've you know, done some infill projects in Washington. Um, so that will be one of the areas of focus when we update the plan is some of the is better design standards. And we'll have to see through the community and commission and council uh, where do they want to go from a design standpoint, you know, in this area? I've heard, you know, different opinions about what's appropriate, you know, in this area. Um, the Washington specific plan tries to thread the needle by identifying the historic district, which is a subset, and then requiring um, historically contextual architecture in there. Um, elsewhere, it really gets into more about sort of paying homage, if you will, to the historic part of it. And the way we've approached that is looking at primarily the building materials that people have used on projects. Um, I think one of the examples to look at, if you ever are out there, is there a, was a um, duplex that was built on 4th Street near D Street uh, uh, five or six years ago, um, right next to the historic buildings. Um, I think it came out pretty well, and it stands up well next to the the truly historic buildings over there. And I believe that owner is building another one now, so it's worth going to take a look at, sort of seeing how well that worked uh, for a new building built next to one that's well over 100 years old. Well, and there was a conversion of a former residence that thir where Third Strike was mm -hmm. into a, a restaurant, and it seemed that that, that was a welcome amenity. Yes. Although right across the street, there was a community garden that kind of got Shabby <laughs> died. Uh, so I'm just I'm wondering, since since in this district are some of the really jewels of the history of the community, and under the charge to this commission about historic preservation, I both appreciate that you brought it, but also wonder if any as you define what those design elements might look like as you discuss what might, be, what might be appropriate in this area. Would you be bringing it back to this commission before you took it to council? Yeah, I think we would need to on that piece of it, absolutely. This is a, this is a big part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we don't have a, currently have a historic preservation ordinance, um, and that's you know, hurt us a, couple, a few times over the years. Um, but, you know, the Washington plan does provide, you know, enough guidance, at least for that area. Uh, there was a house on E Street that was proposed to be demoed, you know, recently, and we brought that actually to the Planning Commission per the way the Washington specific plan, you know, read, which, of course, it predates the, you know, existence sure. of this commission. And I think the process worked um, in terms of determining whether or not that was a historically significant structure or not, and in conjunction with the Historic Society on that one, which was very helpful. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I do see a potential for a more historic preservation coming out as an implementation measure of the general plan. Um, and then I have one more question. Related to this specific area, you know, delineated by the Washington specific plan, 
with infrastructure issues with a changing neighborhood and how things stay secure in that neighborhood is this is this has there been conversation or is there consideration that this area might become a likely candidate for a P bid or for to help maintain the integrity of and and pay for frankly yeah internally at least we have you know kicked around different funding options for more you know long term where we're about to do some infrastructure work out there we have you know large cap and trade money um, for that area so we're working on that currently um, but I do think the area would benefit from some type of financing you know for maintenance and long-term uh, work you know a CFD or something comparable so I, I think that will come out of this work that we're doing now and if that were the case then would you expand it to include the area around the firehouse across from Bridgeview um, you know maybe the to me the CF, a potential CFD or comparable mechanism is um, in a, could be independent of the formally defined historic district because the needs out there are, are greater than just the in the, his, the his historic you know few blocks um, there's a lot of infrastructure needs out there and you know lighting landscaping all of those things um, so it could be it could be district wide you know over the course of the years it's been inspiring to see some of the homeowners of those original jewels that we talked about really make every effort to maintain the integrity of the building and the history of the building but I'm curious it is a pretty heavily residential neighborhood mm -hmm. um, do you have any idea how many of the folks are property owners that live in the homes in the historic district versus how many of those I can think of like there's a there's a several apartment style dwelling how many how many people live in the place, live in the live in the property that they own, and how many are owned or rented from outside the? I know district wide that area has a fairly <coughs> high um, rate of non -owner, non owner occupied homes. Um, in the historic subset, I, I'm not certain offhand, you know, what the percentages are there, but um, it is a pretty high number in the whole Washington neighborhood of non owner occupied. So in in the district, then I'd, I'd be curious to know. If, if it's possible to find out yeah. how many of those homes I and mean, just in in support of as you're framing what this might look like moving forward how it might be supported um, in any kind of a CFD or a, a, you know an improvement district of some kind would need to have property owner support and so I'd be curious to know and then just the opportunity for the people that have maintained their buildings and work so hard and have homes there and live in those homes what they would like it to look like and how the city and this and therefore this Commission could support that so I think knowing what that ratio would be a good strategy for moving forward with how to fund it yes any um, other questions Thank you, David. Sure. We have one request to speak. Don Schatzel, the West Sacramento Historic Society. Is it historic or historical? We have two. Historical. 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 Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chairperson, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, David mentioned it. Uh, the city does not have a historic preservation ordinance, and we've discovered that as well. We've informed the Parks and Recreation Department and the Community Development Department that we are writing a historic preservation ordinance for the city and their consideration. Uh, community development has asked us to also present the backup research that we did, checking into other cities and the ordinances they have. We were planning on presenting that to you at your meeting next week. We're not having a meeting next week, but we are, and we will present it to the staff next week for their consideration. Community development has informed us that that will be included in the general plan update for consideration and discussion. So we're following this information this evening, as you might imagine, very closely. We found it interesting. Our ordinance covers the entire city, not one particular district, and it also c covers archeological sites with respect to Native American sites in Southport, which we've recently experienced, and the history of that population here in the community. So it, uh, you know, it's part of the general plan update, and it's all subject to consideration and 
and changing and discussing. And so we're glad it'll come back to you. We certainly hope so, being the historic commission. We expect it to be here. And we'll follow this information uh, and very what, closely. And what would the timeline so, for that be, for it to come back to uh, us? And we leave that up to you. Um, our role as the historic society is to make sure we are on record as presenting the city in June our version of a draft historic preservation ordinance and as it winds its way through the city we'll follow your schedule and so you present it talk to me about how that how this works if it's not coming here first it'll go to parks it'll go to I, or David I, how, how does it I know my answer, but I'll turn it over to the Parks and Recreation Director for her answer. She would David know. or Cindy, how does it? Or David, whichever one. I'm not quite sure who you're presenting it to. Hi, by the way. Hi. Fine. How, you doing? how are you? Good. I'm good. good. I'm good. Hi, I'm Cindy Tuttle, the Director of Parks and Recreation. Um, I think that's yet to be determined, the actual process. I mean, I think they have to present the ordinance. Obviously, we have to coordinate with the Community Development Department and then determine whether or not um, they'll go to council first to get some direction, go back, put it together, then ship it around to all the commissions, which is what we're doing relevant to the barn policy, or whether the council or the administration is going to want it to come to all the commissions first and then go up to the council, or, you know, so that all needs to be determined at this point and has not been determined. And once we get the formal presentation from um, the Historical Society, then staff will do what they always do. We'll get together around a round table with all the impacted departments and kind of try to figure it out. Um, obviously, I think it has to be tied, and David is much more um, versed on this than I am, but obviously we'll want to tie it with all of the general plan schedule, and um, I don't know that schedule offhand, but David, you may. Do you know that, which would probably give you some indication of when it would come back to this commission. Yeah, I, I see the historic pres at a historic preservation ordinance as a potential implementation measure of the general plan. Uh, we'll finish the general plan this year, um, but a historic preservation ordinance doesn't necessarily have to wait for the general plan, you know, to be done. Um, I s say it as an implementation measure because originally um, I expected to probably be writing one myself. Mm -hmm. So if, if we're getting some help from that yeah. from um, Mr. Schatzel and his um, associates from the Historic Society, then maybe that can be advanced. Ultimately, City Council has to approve the ordinance. Um, it would be subject to CEQA, and, mm -hmm. but we would need to get some input from some, at least some stakeholder, including commissions on it. And I, would I was expect thinking maybe the, the business community might be interested in hearing a presentation mm -hmm. uh, from this, especially if you're moving into this out of the historic district and into and making it citywide, um, thinking the business community might be interested that's, in That's one more stakeholder that I, I think we probably that. should um, pay a visit to. Anyone questions? Great. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. And we also have a request to speak from Martha Mills. Martha? Thank you so much for this opportunity. May I move this down sure. a little bit? The whole, yeah. the whole thing yeah. moves there we go. If, if the podium's too high. I'm Martha Mills. I live at 422 Fourth Street, right smack in the middle of uh, one of the two blocks that are designated as, as primary of those historic uh, homes. My home was built in 1898. I purchased it over 14 years ago because I was looking, I have always wanted to live in a vintage um, Victorian home, but that same kind of style would have been twice the pr price in Midtown Sacramento. So I bought my home, uh, it had been, uh, the prior uh, two owners before it had given it up uh, for taxes, for back taxes languished for a while and if I have a picture of it and bring it with me but if you saw it you would probably say it was a candidate for being demolished fortunately some investors from Los Angeles bought it uh, put a lot of money into it did an excellent job they didn't remodel it they remodeled it and, and, and renovated it to, and kept its architectural integrity and Fortunately, I came along. Uh, it still needed a lot of exterior work, but the interior work was done. So I was very pleased to be able to 
to invest that. So the broader area has become my home. And what I don't see, before coming today, I read the uh, Washington specific plan. I'm a former active member of the West Sacramento Historical Society, so I'm very uh, appreciative of the role here and that you brought them into the conversation early on. What I don't see in the documents, the revised documents, or and I read the survey again before coming, I don't see a description of preserving the value of the neighborhood that is Washington and Broderick. I look, I hear investment, I hear development, I don't hear a lot of acknowledgement about preserving that place which has uh, been there, has been home to many multiple generations of families. Many on my block, we are, there are most of them are low income, working poor, very culturally diverse. Some are on their third generation and fourth generation in their homes. Some have never left those homes. And yet, um, their home would likely, and in the survey, be described as dilapidated because they don't have the funding to do the kind of reservation, uh, renovation that you're talking about in the spirit of preservation. Over the years, I've fortunately had the financial ability to you know, put a new roof on, paint my house as a painted lady uh, in the spirit of San Francisco's painted ladies, been able to landscape. I want to one of the best of garden view a uh, long time ago. Uh, may I continue? May I? I um, well, actually, Does that happen? Oh, that's, that's yes. up to you. But we do have another item, so if okay. you could move towards summary, that would be great. So um, my concern is funding whatever you do, that yes, we need those standards. My neighbor is the person that you described who built the duplex, that's who lives on this side. This side, this person, was so encumbered with code enforcement fines. That's how it's been. It's been a, a punitive, not an incentivized renovation, and I don't fault the code enforcement, but that person individ had to just recently sell his home because he couldn't afford to do the kind of work. I have looked for funds from community development over the years. They're not there. The support from Habitat for Humanity that was offered for weatherization, et cetera, was nowhere near enough. So. Uh, please put in the forefront that this is a neighborhood, it is a living neighborhood with generations, which is part of the history, and that there should be incentives for the people who live there. One last comment is a uh, stakeholder group are the current owners. I didn't hear them mentioned and called out, but yes, a lot of them are absentee landlords, and I'd like to see the city bring them together and say this is a priority. What do you need to make the buildings that you own and you have rented out um, come up to standards of uh, historic um, integrity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. David, I have um, a couple of questions. <clears throat> this is going to be a long-awaited and, and much-anticipated um, moving forward of a, not only the district but a historic policy for the community and the general plan. For the purposes of this group, would it be possible to email this commission the um, current iteration of the Washington specific plan? I think it'd be great if we could all start on the same page. Yes, it's, it is on our website too, so um, you're, anyone's welcome to download that at any time. Uh, Daniel, could you help us with yeah. that then? Yeah, we can send great, out the link. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then is there a timeline for this moving forward? I, I mean, I'm here. It, it sounds like maybe next week there would have been a policy for us, but this week there's not. Or, as you're looking at it, yes, yeah, and I'm thinking specific of the the former LJ Urban project mm -hmm. that it sits that property sits in the middle of this neighborhood, and I know that there, I, I believe it was approved by planning for the Bar Bartis Homes is going to start development on that property. Yes, they're going to build But we're talking out. about standards. I hear Martha's concern. And I think probably I'm speaking for the commission, but a concern of a historic neighborhood becoming gentrified to the point that the people that have been there can't stay there. And guidelines that might need to be put into place around what new development might look like. Um, so I don't, I, don't, I don't know. I'm just wading into it. Well, what are you thinking? 
I, again, I can't give you a definitive timeline. Um, it hasn't even been presented to us yet. Um, and so in, while Mr. Schatzel may have presented you a document next week, that document has to be completely vetted through the staff process. We have to determine how we want that to fit in with the overall general plan. I totally agree with David. It would be an implementation piece. And it's, it's just timing whether they want to actually move pieces separately outside of the general plan. That's kind of a policy decision that's really not within my purview to make that decision. It's more in community development and ultimately, you know, obviously the council's purview to make those types of decisions. So, but what I can tell you is once we've received the document, we will do our due diligence to put some type of schedule together so that everyone knows here's what our plan is to address this issue moving forward. And once we have that, we can obviously let all of you know what that looks like. But it's just really premature for me to say, hey, we're going to bring you something in six months because I, I don't know that. We could get this and it could be a lot of back and forth between community development and PAR and everybody. Um, you know, maybe it's a perfect document and we can move it forward. I just don't know. So once we get it, then we can put a plan together and totally bring it forward to you. Great. Our next meeting is, is it September? Okay, so September. It may not be as soon as September, but it wouldn't be any sooner than that going through the process, correct? Don't know, because we can I always understand. call a special meeting. I understand. <laughs> if, we, okay. if we so desire, understand. right? So yeah, but what, again, once we, once we know, I'll, we'll make sure and let everybody know. Great, thank you. Item number four, if there, if there are no further requests to speak or questions from the commission. I'll move ahead to item number four. Consideration of scope of work and schedule for the National Endowment for the Arts Grant, Katie Jacobson, Community Investment Manager. And we have one request to speak at this point. Uh, good evening, Chair, Commissioners. My name is Katie Jacobson. I'm a Community Investment Manager with the Economic Development Department. Um, tonight, a staff is seeking commission comments on the National Endowment of the Arts, Our Town Grant Scope of Work and Schedule. The Our Town Grant is a $125,000 award to a collaboration of Sacramento, West Sacramento, and Crocker Art Museum. Um, our town program of National Endowment of the Arts is intended to harness the power of art to create vibrant communities. Also staff tonight is recommending that the commission appoint a commission member, one of the commission members to serve as a stakeholder for this NEA project. The Washington Realized document, um, the National Endowment for the Arts proposal grew out of planning efforts for the Washington District that were going on between 2013 and early 2015. During this period, staff and community stakeholders were doing analyses to develop the sustainable community strategy for the Washington District that was funded <coughs> by a $400,000 grant from federal HUD and local matching funds. This plan is called Washington Realized and it was adopted by Council in February of 2015. And the strategies in the Washington Realized document are intended to affect a shift in the district towards transit served development patterns. Transit served development and pa patterns, um, the intention is to create inclusive communities in an urban core with bicycle, pedestrian, and streetcar alternatives to car travel. So as we identified the challenges in this district to creating this pattern of development, the smart growth pattern of development, what we began to do as part of the process and with the stakeholders and consultants is we began to think about how can art intervene in this environment? How can we use art to solve these challenges and deficiencies that we've been identifying? And through this uh, about a two-year uh, public engagement project and working with various community stakeholders, foundations, and the residents, what we identified is that art is a very important way of intervening in an environment like this to improve quality of life. So what we identified is that art can um, reinforce circulation, it can serve as wayfinding, it can spark revitalization, it enhances security by drawing visitors into the interest and the beauty that's in the public realm. 
It, it communicates and indicates a forward momentum for the district. It also enhances walkability and creates a much more pleasant um, uh, walking environment. And it also creates a distinct identity that um, certain art, art objects can become landmarks for a district. So the, the Washington Realized document included a park master plan, and this is the element of the document that really addresses the important role of art in regeneration of the Washington district. So this graphic depicts the overall parks plan, and art features are incorporated into this district as essential features. So the plan is to create four small urban parks that are linked through a series of walkable garden streets, which lead to the river walk. These parks are intended to reinforce circulation goals, provide neighborhood park amenities, create a concentration of uses, and shape identity for the district. The placement of art icons and enhanced landscaping is proposed along E Street and C Street. Um, these, this is an example of some wayfinding elements that I found in um, Johannesburg post-apartheid. Um, they have used art extensively in that city to sort of revitalize um, and regenerate the city. And so they wanted to particularly concentrate wayfinding towards this major bridge. And they um, had artists create these metal sculptures of these trees which are indigenous to the area. But it's just one example of what the community and staff was envisioning might be happening in the Washington area. There's another example of um, in another community in the United States where they've used larger lit beacons for the same purpose. So in the um, uh, Washington district, we also have um, these art beacons that exist um, at, in addition to the plan to add additional art beacons. So art beacons will be larger pieces. There are um, four of them planned for the Riverwalk area and they would be um, seen from freeways and they would be able to be seen from a distance. And those are denoted on this graphic by the red asterisks. So the art beacons and icons are to, to be placed along C Street and E Street, as, again, as the major east-west connections to the waterfront. And also these art icons will be placed along um, the streetcar route and will connect the Civic Center, it will connect the statues in front of City Hall, then all the way through to the Tower Bridge. Um, there are two art beacons currently in the Washington District, and one is the Water Tower, and the other is the Large River Walk sign. So we're recommending that the Water Tower serve as a beacon, but the recommendation is that it really needs to be redesigned and relocated because it really does not serve as, as um, an entry feature in, it, in its current state. So you can see in the slide I found, um, I think this is in Brooklyn, where they've taken some old water towers on top of buildings and they've let artists reimagine them and turn them into art pieces. The city is also incorporating art features into the bridge district and they did that happen with the 2009 amendments to the bridge district specific plan. In the bridge district, um, art and civic amenities are in the specific plan like including enhanced signage and small civic um, urban style park spaces. And these have also been planned to create visual connections from interior developments to the river open space. And public funding for art in the bridge district was included in both the uh, formation of the infrastructure financing district and CFD 27 formation. So as you are aware um, already through your prior uh, commission uh, actions and um, decisions, the Bridge Districts, there's been two art projects that have been approved. The first one is called the Dangos, and it's two ceramic sculptures done by June Kaneko. One is installed in Garden Park. The other one is currently in our warehouse, and it will be stalled um, uh, in the next month, probably adjacent to the barn area, um, which is currently under construction. There was another, here's a picture of those. Here's a picture of the first one installed in Garden Park. That's the barn that's being created. 
The barn is a, uh, also, in a way, serves as a sculpture. It's a new performance venue that's being built in the Bridge District. But the structure itself almost acts as a sculptural form in that it, it's very beautiful, it's surprising and unexpected, and it, it sort of provides a visual relief to the grid pattern of development that you would see in an urban area like the Bridge District. Um, the other Bridge District artwork underway is the Frederico Diaz sculpture, which is primarily funded by a housing-related parks grant from the state. Um, this is called Subtile. It's um, highly reflective, and the artist was inspired by the river and the riparian habitat and had a desire to pull those elements closer to the river walk and pull that, um, that sensory experience um, to those that weren't as close to the river. So it is located, or it will be located, near the middle of the district. The piece is currently being fabricated in the Czech Republic, and it's expected to be put in crates and shipped to West Sacramento in July. And then as soon as we finish permitting, we will be able to get that installed. And there's a little bit more. You can see how the artist is playing with the, the form of it. it. Again, it's intended to sort of mirror the like riparian habitat, the bushes and the tree shapes. And you can see that's a rendering of it. We're trying to place it as close to the river as we possibly can. And then, oops. the reflective surface um, of the piece. Again, it's intended, it's the intention of the artist or the aspiration of the artist to have that reflect the clouds, the river, the water, the habitat around it. So during these previous planning efforts, Sacramento, the Metropolitan, Sacramento Metropolitan Arts Commission, West, Sama West Sacramento, and Crocker um, Art Museum began to collaborate on a broader vision and eventually submitted a grant proposal to the National Endowment of the Arts called River Crossing. In July of 2015, the National Endowment for the Arts awarded an Our Town grant of $125,000 to this collaboration and uh, West Sacramento's share of that is $75,000. The funds are to create a master plan that will connect the NBA arena, the Capitol Mall, and the Crocker Art Museum with the new um, and existing residential development in the Washington District. And the, um, it will culminate in the acquisition and installation of a, um, a piece that will be, one artist will be commissioned to create, that will be to communicate the concept of river crossing, so it may use light, it may use ceramic, we don't know what type of materials an artist will be inspired by, but the goal will be to communicate this concept of a single piece that bridges the, the river in some way. Katie, could, could you explain that again? So the $75,000 that is, that, that is on this side of the river, is that one piece? The, Right now, the budget that we have established for this single artist creation spanning river, <laughs> river crossing installation, um, we have set between the two cities at around $200,000. But I mean, in the art world, as you know, by the right. time you permit and put a foundation in, that's not a lot of money for something that has to be of this significance. So I think that we're still looking at the possibility of trying to get other sponsors that might contribute to it once we have a concept of it. And I think that just in, again, these are just um, brainstorming discussions we've had. You know, we've talked about possibly that you could use light or sound or something like that as and well. And it would start on one side of the river and there, the theme would be carry, I see like eight locations on this map. I'm not understanding. So, so, okay, <clears throat> so this map is a graphic that depicts the master plan that the museum and two cities are creating. So our goal is to visually connect um, downtown, the Capitol, the NBA arena, and then Crocker's new sculpture garden that they have planned 
along our streetcar route and into West Sacramento. So this is a master plan that will be embedded into the specific plan that will go on for 20 years. Mm -hmm. But as part of this, this Our Town project that we're doing today, we'll, we'll be just doing one installation. And do you know where that will be? Um, no, I think that um, in working with the Crocker, obviously they don't want, the piece technically could be anywhere in, uh, along our riverfront in the Washington District. So um, our city got priority for this NEA funding because of the work that we had done in Washington and because right. of the Washington Realized Document. So it has to be in the Washington District, but it could be anywhere on the riverfront in the Washington District. But when you look at Crocker and its desire as a partner um, and its goals with its sculpture park, I think that they will want the piece to be as close to the Tower Bridge as possible. Um, that said, you have to look at how does the Tower Bridge visually compete with what you're trying to right. do. So it's going to be a challenge. Well, and there is a piece of public art at our landing on our side yes. of the Tower Bridge already. So. <laughs> and then you, and then the thought is that that then would tie into the other four proposed installations along the river up along the river walk. Right, so each of the installations that are on the, uh, the beacons, we call them, that are on the river walk itself, those will be large pieces. So um, right now we're, we're going to attempt that the water tower becomes one of them and that we, um, one approach. So part of this funding that we've gotten from our town will be to um, get an art consultant on board that really can do a detailed implementation plan for Washington and what and and a Tower Bridge gateway and all the way up to this city hall sort of what is this art supposed to achieve what is it, it at its objective and what you could have um, cur curators will be part of this team and they could recommend specific approaches for each of these locations which might be very different some might be inspired by his you know history um, some might be inspired by, um, you know, some might give an artist more free reign. One of the ideas we talked about is having a university possibly take over doing a piece or more, um, or a community foundation. Um, but that's why this, um, this funding is important because we want to do this extensive public engagement process. We want it to be cohesive so that it has a system that really does communicate on both sides of the river. And, um, and we want to have a very clear plan of what are we trying to achieve, what are the specific locations, how can each piece be funded, and then what's an acquisition plan. For example, curators could say, let's just develop a list of local artists and let's just do like four local artists and four artists from around the country and then do a direct acquisition from that list. Or we could do a full-blown you know, panel selection process for each piece. So that's just the detail that we really want to get um, back in front of your commission and get, get implemented within our city so that, there, that we've done our public engagement, we've shaped the vision of, of the community about what they want to see. And Katie, can I ask uh, about the art consultant? Would that be somebody who would be working with both Sacramento and West Sacramento, or would they be working independently with West Sacramento? So it's a single grant, and right now uh, Sacramento is administering the grant on our behalf. So we have a contract, and we have our funds and our match, and they have theirs. So we're, we're using the same team of consultants somewhat, but for I'm taking our plan to a whole different level than they are. They're just still in the phase of doing a downtown specific plan. They're still trying to figure out where residential is going. So they're going to locate their art, they're, but they're not at our, where we are from the analysis we've already done in our, our outreach. So we're going to go to a lot. So we'll probably have a different consultant on our side. Great. Thank you. Um, so that was really concluding my presentation. So um, again, these funds are to create a master plan that, that will connect um, these downtown arts, entertainment, the capital um, venues with our new and existing development in the Washington district. And, and then to install the, you know, this culminating piece of work that communicates the river crossing idea. And um, with that, I am, my um, presentation is complete. Um, 
I did want to add just from the conversation or the presentation earlier that I'm managing the um, infrastructure project that's going in in the Washington district. And we are um, planning to use historic lighting and historic features in, in terms of any signage, any benches. Um, and we, we really are looking to enhance and protect um, the historic nature in terms of the design elements that, that we're choosing. But I think that will be a hugely transformative um, piece of, of, or improvements when, it, when they're finished that will really you know, beckon toward that district's future um, and what it can be. Great, thank you. We have um, any questions? Yeah. I would just be curious to hear more about the Garden Street and how we ended up on that route in particular. We um, started with where the major connections are into the river walk off of Third Street and um, what, what's clear and what every consultant and everyone tell, you know, would tell you is that there's no, when you're driving down Third Street, there's no awareness that there's a public river walk amenity, you know, <laughs> to the right. east. Um, it's, even though there are some, there's some signage there, um, the community feels that there's a couple challenges there. One, it needs to be communicated clearly that there's these major public entry points to the river walk and that this river walk is a public amenity that is, you know, for that neighborhood and for the region. So we really looked at those streets as being the streets and knowing that we'll be connecting the river walk there at C Street in the future and that would be another way that we would get our major access point there. And then that Universal Street, um, I don't have the graphic up, but there's then um, the river one, so there's a, a stretch of land that has an easement on it that's just on the northern border of what we call the River One site near Tower Bridge. So we anticipate that we would convert that again to an end, so that it very communicates to the public, this is an entry feature, this is a path to the river walk. Um, and so that's how we chose those locations, is where is there a major entry point that could be protected for the public? I ask a question about funding. I'm sorry, Anthony, did you get questions? No, no, I would just say, oh, I just, I would just add then, then thinking maybe even further out than how those pathways could continue. So even as we're talking about these conversations now, what would it be like 10 or 15 years from now if some of those paths wanted to continue out even further? Because that would just be an interesting design element. And, and I would add too, I, I agree with university partnerships or partnering up with some of our community organizations because they might be willing to take on some of these tasks and to help guide input or do some forms or something to be able to bring the community and really gather around support. So, but I support that idea in general. We good? I have a couple questions. Um, so, I, I knew that the Bridge District had a CFD, but I didn't realize that an EIFD had been formalized in the city anywhere. The Bridge District Development Agreement, um, the specific plan and the CFD were all very dependent on redevelopment funding for the parking structures in particular because that was the that was considered the public's um, investment in density. It's an incentive that we would own and build these shared parking structures. So as soon as redevelopment uh, areas were eliminated by the legislature, uh, the development agreements were needed to be fixed because there was a source of funding missing at that point. Um, you may recall that we even litigated it. Right. So uh, we had, we formed an infrastructure district immediately there. Oh, see, I, I, I thought, I didn't realize, I thought that the legislation for an infrastructure financing district had only just recently been formalized. And so I, I, I knew that, I knew about the CFD, but I didn't realize that we had an infrastructure financing district. So we formed the one in the bridge district prior to the latest amendment. So it's not called enhanced infrastructure district and it doesn't have quite the same tools that the enhanced infrastructure district has that will form in other areas of the city. But we were still able to use that tool and form an infrastructure financing district. So it replaced redevelopment funding. Right. Um, any challenges with a permanent installation of public art on top of a levee? Yes. Because <laughs> that's what, 
that's a levy. It is a levy. Right. Um, I have immediately, as soon as the commission and the council acquired that piece of artwork, I worked with the artist uh, extensively. The artist, and understandably so, wanted it as close to the river as it could possibly be. So we've um, submitted a, completed a, a f we, we analyzed where there was free board and we analyzed where it doesn't really permeate the, le the hypothetical levy structure and then we've submitted, had a meeting, submitted an application and uh, so far in the initial meetings they uh, seem to be saying that we, we can ask for this permit. But in, you know, as you probably know, it's a, it's a challenge so until we receive the permit it's still possible that I might have to relocate it which would be a shame. And then um, the, the wayfaring art and that you talked about moving or transforming the existing water tower but not the kind of tomato trellis looking tower with the crane on it which almost immediately confuses everyone that submits public art here. They all stick a crane on it. I'm always going, a crane? But it's because it's on the tomato looking thing. Um, so if you move that water tower and it's going to be along the river, doesn't that also put that on top of a levee? Um, I mean, because the Riverwalk Park is a levee. Right, and but uh, Riverwalk Park has an encroachment permit for hardscape, for half walls, for cement, for okay. uh, so lighting, you know, it's got conduit trenched in it. So it, because it's a levee, you still are allowed to apply for an encroachment permit, but there's just, it's just very restrictive about what you can do. And it's possible that, um, you know, we'll run into problems with, with, with moving the water tower. Um, but if you do have comments about that other structure, I would be interested to hear what the commission's thoughts are about if they like that, if they want that to remain or. Well, for years there's been a question about how do we maintain those two pieces. Those were one of the first original pieces of public art in the community. We talked forever about how at least the water tower and now the other structure have become faded and kind of dilapidated and what we have a public art fund, what would the maintenance on that be? The staff came back and advised that it was prohibitive, it'd be $60,000 to, as I remember, um, to paint the tower to, to bring it back to what it was before, now it's just kind of gray, but it used to be colors. Um, so, so moving it, I just, the cost of that. Well, it has you, to be moved with the bridge. The bridge is going to take it out. Oh, so <laughs> it, it's going to be relocated slightly. So we would have that opportunity to have the bridge pick up that relocation. I was going to say, oh, good, then they could pay for it. That's <laughs> um, great. But okay. I would love to see that piece to me. I could just see, like, um, you know, Sac City College Art Department. I mean, I would love for them to just adopt it and transform it or be imaginative with what they the, might like Just to see. The, the design of that water tower is classic Central Valley. Classic Central Valley, 1930s, Mickey and my clothes, 40s. Just there was water before that, there was another one going back to the I was thinking it would be cool. I'm sorry. Out yeah, wait, we I'm can't, sorry. wait, we, we can't really do that. Yeah, so, we didn't yeah. used to come here because the right. can't. So Mickey, if you if you fill that a request to speak, then we could have this conversation, so that it would be for the public record. Okay, come on up. Tell us about the water tower. <laughs> no, no, all the way all the way up to the microphone. Tell us who you are. That's why I don't. This your name is? My name is Mickey Fawcett. I'm a member of the West Sacramento Historical Society right. and uh, live and die Broderick history. And uh, anyway, on the question on the water tower, when it was that water tower built? <sighs> There's a, a, we have pictures of a water tower before that, that that goes back, I don't know, I wasn't ready for this, you know, so there's a bunch of numbers jumbling in my mind, but uh, uh, they had a lot of water problems there in Broderick, and it was in 1920, I think, that 
that they had to do something about how they were getting water to get it to the fire apparatuses and all that. So I'm, I'm just trying to think that tower there would, would have to, I, I think would be after 1900. 1930, I never paid that much. I pay more attention to the original, the one that was there before with the house, and that's what I was thinking. The city could come, we could get a grant for the Historical Society to build a museum right there where the house used to be with a water tower. That's, that has potential. And that right there, anyway, that's. <laughs> okay, but you think probably 1930s for that existing structure. Yeah, we, I mean, we, we can find out. It's in our, it's in our book on the inventory. It just seems iconic to me, and so relocating it and keeping it is, um, maybe that's some, I know Katie's interested in that happening too. I was just wondering how that bridge was going to go in with that water tower. It was going to be a tight fit, the curve, but without the water tower, no problem anymore. You and know now you know. <laughs> so thank you so much. Okay. Um, I had, and so then the way the wayfinding art designating drawing people's attention to parks the parks that are deeper into the district is that is that a chicken and an egg thing I mean do you build a park and then the art or do you put the art up and then the park or what what's the time frame for that um, well we'd like to do them simultaneously so I have two two of these art icons, the smaller, more intimate pieces in the Washington infrastructure scope of work. Um, they're really intended, again, for pedestrian wayfinding primarily, and then the parks just enhance that, um, creating a green environment. Um, so I, right now, intend to explore different locations, but most likely think both pieces will need to be on E Street. Um, and so those will go in when we do our frontage and um, planting strips and uh, bike striping and, and, the, and the selection for that art for those pieces is that this collaboration with the Crocker and the Metropolitan and that's so what I'd like if I can sp I might have to speed the consultant up that I need to have the we need a, a vision a curatorial vision uh, and an approach to those two pieces quickly because I need to buy them we need to acquire them in about 12 months and so um, I could pull them out of the project and we do them afterwards, but I just as soon create the impact while I'm putting in the other infrastructure. So that's what I hope that this master plan will vet with um, the electeds and commission members and, and the public as to an approach. Um, we, we only have an $80,000 budget for art, so it's not a lot. I, I think they'll probably be more intimately scaled pieces. Any other questions for Ms. Jacobson? Okay, we have one. And, and excuse me, I wish I could speak more to it. Do, were we were talking about a transportation policy related to bike trails connected to the river, does this have any connection to some of those projects as well? Right, exactly. So one of the, in fact, can you bring up my um, presentation? Um, we're doing major bike improvements with this project. I can show you some renderings if I can bring this up again. So, for example, this is the existing intersection at um, Capitol uh, and Fifth, West Capitol and Fifth. So that was the before picture. So we're going to be eliminating that uh, redundant signal and creating a separated bike track and uh, a you know beautiful median planted um, with possibly canopy trees. This would be another possible location where you could include art because you would be trying to rein uh, reinforce the wayfinding of the pets and bicyclists, you know, along this route. And then um, this is an exist. This is another example of an existing street. As you can see, when we looked at Washington, realized there's the, the frontage is inadequate. Um, there is, uh, you know, there's all kinds of problems with walkability on streets like this. There's absolutely no street lights, so it's pitch black at night. It doesn't feel secure. And this is what we hope to accomplish. At, you know, we'll um, be doing the first phase of undergrounding utilities. We'll be putting in historic street lights. We'll be striping for bicycles. And so 
um, and, and you know, planting canopy trees where they're lacking. So this is the kind of transformation, excuse me, that we hope this project will bring. So it will be very much about bicycling and pedestrian. Thank you. We have one request to speak on item number four, Lana Palhamas. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Lana Palhamas. I'm a member of the Wasec Historical Society and served as its president years ago. Um, just to make something clear, uh, between the years of 1900 to 1987, um, the Washington District was referred to as Broderick. And if you look at any map, you're going to see Broderick, not Washington. And the reason I'm bringing that up now is because um, I'm requesting the commissioners to consider a deviation from the river crossing components to include a statue or a landmark of David C. Broderick commemorating his namesake, Broderick, California. And that's what that area was known as prior to being incorporated as a city. For this reason, um, for the reason for this request is to bring to the commissioner's attention the important contribu contribution that David C. Broderick had to early California and the reason that the community known as Washington was changed officially to Broderick. I'll bring you maps to show you that it was called Broderick. Bro David Broderick came to California in 1849 and he served as um, a California state senator. He was the second lieutenant governor and he served as a United States Senator from San Francisco. He was adamantly opposed to slavery and entering slavery into California especially. In several books, it is believed that his last words he uttered were, I die because I was opposed to slavery. In some historical circles, he is considered the first martyr of the Civil War. Um, he was killed in a duel. He was only 39 years old, but David, uh, Judge David Terry, who killed him, was pro-slavery and he was from the South. Uh, David Broderick was buried at Lone Mountain Cemetery in San Francisco and he had the largest public funeral at that time with over 30,000 mourners. There's a lot of stuff popping up about Broderick. I don't know if you've been seeing it, but uh, there seems to be some energy with that particular name and it's about time. In 1863, Governor Leland Stanford approved an appropriation of $5,000 of state funds to assist in the construction of a monument to the Honorable David C. Broderick. It proved to be unfortunate that the tribute was built over David C. Broderick's grave. In 1946, San Francisco voted to have all the cemeteries moved down to Colma. So everything that represented uh, memorials and, and grave stuff went into the San Francisco Bay. In 1893, the Washington Post Office was officially changed to Broderick and I have paperwork to show you the changes. When, um, okay, uh, when the Crocker family gave their collection of paintings to the city of Sacramento, it, it contained an original painting of David C. Broderick. And if you go to the Crocker Art Gallery, you can see that painting of David C. Broderick. Why do I bring this up? Because I think we need some recognition. I love the art, I love art, I love uh, modern art. But I think if we're looking at a historic district and what we can prove to the world about Broderick and what he actually contributed to uh, the early days of California. Um, I have a, a picture of a monument that was the original monument that was in San Francisco. I also have the original picture, well, it's not original, it's a copy of the picture that you can find at the Crocker Art Gallery. And um, also he has, picked, uh, he has statues of himself in the state senate chambers in California and it's still there if you go into the state, chamber cha uh, state senate chambers, you'll see them there. Okay, thank um, you. So that's my wrap up. So um, in considering uh, as maybe another approach uh, to take some his historical figures into consideration, I think would be a nice thing to think about. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Is it possible that you could share that with um, staff? Do you have Yes, that? I have this uh, for staff. Do you have it electronically? No. 
Okay. I don't have, but I, I, I can give this to you folks. I made it for you so that you can have it. Be great. It's, 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 a, it's a resource. Thank you. So at this point, it, is this a, a request for the rec so the rec tonight is just a request for comment and feedback and then the recommendation that the commission appoint a member to serve as a stakeholder on the NEA project team and by stakeholder that means that they would represent the commission's perspective and um, objectives and they would uh, be given one-on-one -on -one individual interviews during the process um, so you could have time to select that commission member and just let me know. Um, and do you know when that commitment would begin? Probably, we, well, we hope to begin this in um, July. Mm -hmm. But for we have a lot of one-on-one -on -one interviews to do, so if the member wasn't available, we can certainly schedule it later. Um, I'm going to have some time on my hands. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if any of you are interested or if there would be any opposition or suggestion to. Go for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. I'd be happy yeah. to. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. And we'll look forward to hearing more about both of these. Hi, Don. Would you like to come up and speak? Thank you. I tried to get your attention during public comment. I'm actually representing myself now. I have enjoyed Katie's work when we talked about the artwork she talked about on the river, but I, I feel obligated to say this. Whenever I hear we're collaborating with Sacramento, with all due respect to our neighbors, we are West Sacramento. We are not an extension of Sacramento, nor are we are an extension of Midtown Sacramento. So I certainly hope the artwork is not a duplicate of what we might see across the river or a smaller version or a bigger version of something they may have or our Wayfarer signs are our own signs with our own design, not necessarily, because we do partner with them. They're nice guys most of the time. But, you know, we're ourselves. We are West Sacramento. I would uh, say. And I certainly hope it reflects our community, which kind of ties into what Lana was saying, and our history and where we're going as a community not always with what they're doing. So, yeah, couldn't agree Thank more. Uh, a little, a little feedback. This um, is not the. F this concept was presented to this commission, and I think that almost to a person, that opinion was strongly held. What we've seen demonstrated with staff is a is a a, a unique um, recognizing that. Very often, partnerships and collaboration have brought big benefit to mm -hmm. the city of West Sacramento mm -hmm. and to its residents, but also acknowledging that, um, that we are unique. And what we've seen in the uh, pieces that were brought to us for the piece along the river was that definitely um, there will be no big plastic poo. And <laughs> well, we did. Okay? I it, mean, it's, uh, we, it, it was unique. It was un that, that theme has been well represented and is at the forefront of almost every conversation we have about this well, NEA I'm project. happy to hear that, but you know, we know there is a never ending need to bring that up and remind people and that's okay. So I'm glad you feel that way, so thank you. Great, thank you. Moving on to, uh, thank you Katie. Thank you so much. Move, item number five, commission calendar, future items request. Are there any changes to the, Daniel, there is one, a change. We have a joint meeting with uh, Parks. Correct. On what date? Uh, that will be July 18th at 6 p.m. The uh, meeting will be held at the LOCKS facility, and then we'll be reconvening here at City Hall at 7 p.m. And you'll send us notice and- e Yeah, I'm gonna be sending out a notice as well as the agenda ahead of time. Okay, great, thank you so much, and then, uh, are there any future item requests? Commissioners? The report the, from Historical Society. So we heard requests for follow-up both in the historic preservation um, policy 
and uh, related to, of course, the NEA project, the Wayfaring project. Any other requests for future items? I was, uh, I enjoyed very much her presentation of uh, David C. Broderick's um, historical significance. How does that happen when, when she proposes that we maybe have a statue? How does that conversation start? How does well, like um, like all things, mm -hmm. <laughs> under the direction of council, and we um, council has a public art fund mm -hmm. that is kind of uh, dwindled right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but and and we have a responsibility for maintenance. Yeah. So I know that staff has been um, staff from the planning department and from housing and the. Um, Katie Jacobson has been very receptive to our feedback in the past. Mm -hmm. She has the resources now, and I would suspect that should there, in all of their skills at finding grants and funding, and you know that that might be an area that she might find focus. Mm -hmm. And whether if, if that would sit at the foot of the Tower Bridge or not is, you know, yet to be determined. But there are several historical. There's a historic plaque along the river walk that talks about the original salmon factory that was there and that was done through some grant funding and so I, I think it's it's a point well taken. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and maybe as community development and parks look at development in the Broderick neighborhood, um, that I mean I, I I can see the parks director's wheels turning as we speak. Mm -hmm. So okay. Good. I think that yeah. it was it was a point well taken. Yeah. Point well taken. Anything else? Motion to adjourn. I'll motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.